right. Hello, everyone. As you come in, please let me know if you can hear me okay, see everything fine, just to confirm and say hello. Um, I always want to say good morning or good afternoon, but I just have to say good noon or good day. Good day to you. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and begin. Again, hopefully I can see that some of you are here. Okay, great. Thank you so much. <clears throat> How are you guys today, by the way? Um, I teach two lectures, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and this is my second one, so if I'm a little hoarse, um, I promise I'm not going to give you coronavirus through the, the webcam here. Um, it's just the fact that I uh, taught a course already today. Glad to hear it. Okay, so we're going to pick up today. I don't really have any new announcements for you. I have not posted any quizzes. I've not really done much updating aside from posting Tuesday's lecture to, to Moodle. Uh, last time we, we left off in our PowerPoints on this slide, we were talking about different ways of defining concentrations. We're talking about number concentrations. We used bleach, the kills 99% of germs type of an example. And so we were talking about how we how we define each plaque or each bacteria uh, colony that grew and counting that as a way to um, determine how many pathogens or how many particles are in solution per volume. Um, as we look at different concentrations, work with different systems, we're going to need these um, mass or number concentrations. And so I wanted to distinguish those for you. <laughs> General Kenobi. Um, and to move from there uh, and kind of review that last slide, the way we can talk about how many, um, how much removal we have, that 99%, we can write N over N naught, so meaning N is the current, the current number we have, and N naught is the uh, excuse, yeah the initial we had so initial and I say number but really what I mean is number per volume so when we take a look at this n over n naught this is the fraction that is remaining after some process or some treatment so if we for example have some sort of a box where we have a reaction taking place and water coming out, we would say our n naught is what's entering it and what's leaving is n. And we'll talk more about that uh, specifically and how that works um, in the next set of slides. Okay, so in the example where we started with 100 and ended with 1 per liter or per milliliter, whatever, let's write that as one, let's say particle one particle for every liter. Um, if we divide this by, so that n divided by n naught, divided by 100 particles per liter, then we see the, the units cancel, and we're left with 1 over 100, which is equal to 0 0.01. We can also see that we can rewrite this or uh, rearrange it if we decide instead of the fraction remaining, we want the fraction removed. So if one is remaining, that means 99 was removed, right? So the way to express that would be one minus n over n naught. So um, the amount remaining would be uh, or amount removed would be 100 minus the 1 gives us the 99 that were removed. So that, that should be intuitive, but I wanted to write it out clearly for you because you're going to have to switch through these sometimes. You'll maybe have a problem where I say, okay, this treatment step removes 99.9% .9 of the germs. How many germs were um, were remaining after the process only went halfway through? Or something like that. You know, we'll, we'll have problems where we have to transfer from 
uh, remaining to removed. And you're going to often find that setting up systems where you're working with some form of n over n naught or c over c naught, um, meaning the final over the initial, occasionally we'll flip it and we'll look at the um, initial divided by the final. Um, just be familiar with this way of working with these numbers, right? The, the fractions versus um, uh, of removal versus fractions remaining. Another way to deal with this is uh, if we take this in log form. So log meaning logarithm, uh, you know, log base 10 of x, you know, is, you know, equals y. Um, that means, you know, this form says y to the 10, or excuse me, 10 to the y is equal to x, right? That's, see if we can get, there we go. So 10 to the y equals x. So you're familiar with logarithms. You've had this um, quite often. Just wanted to remind you that that's, that's what we're using here when we we describe this number change, or this, uh, sometimes we use it with a mass concentration as well. If we write it as a three log reduction, what we're talking about is we're taking the log of n over n naught, and we're saying the n over n naught has been reduced by 10 to the minus three. So if we take 10 to the minus three, this is equal to 0 0.001, because it's the same thing, right? It's the same thing as saying, so 10 to the minus three is equal to uh, one over 10 to the three, which equal, is equal to one over 1,000. Um, and that is the same thing, right? So when we say log, um, log of n over n naught equals minus three, we're saying that n over n naught is equal to 10 to the minus three. So just as the, the log rules go, um, 10 to the minus three equals n over n naught. So that's what we mean if we say we have a three log reduction of bacteria, that means the bacteria, there's only 0.1% of them remaining, or there's 0 0.001 uh, of them remaining as a fraction. This also means we had a 99 Point nine percent removal. And again, be familiar with changing between percentage and um, fraction, right? It's very simple stuff, but in the context of a bigger problem, I wanted to give you close attention here um, to say that what we're doing is we're taking that 0.999 remaining after I uh, removed to leave just 0 0.001 remaining, and we can multiply that by 100 percentage to get the 99% removal. And so here you can also see that that means, you know, we could have just said 0.1% remaining. Okay, this is probably more elaborate than you need, but I just wanted to be very clear what we're doing and introduce the term log reduction um, so that you can understand. Uh, sometimes we use log growth, you know, the bacteria grew uh, by three logs overnight. Um, this terminology is just a shortcut. It's a shortcut that you know the math already, so really what I'm doing is adding it to the language that we can use to solve problems and to understand what the problems are, are asking for. <clears throat> okay, any questions or issues with that? Um, as always, you're totally welcome to write it in the chat if you do have a question. Um, and I, I will always uh, be looking and, and aim to uh, stop and answer any questions that you may have. Okay, so from there, I wanted to move to mass balances. So we have a good understanding of the units that we're going to use and how we're going to talk about them, what's important, how to do some conversions. And now when we talk about mass balances, really what we're looking at is defining some, what we call a control volume, 
And in that volume, what's happening to the mass? Are we sending mass, um, you know, how much is added to it? How much is subtracted from it? And really what's happening? So if we have this circle here as our control volume, then we're interested in what's happening within this circle. And we say, uh, you know, we have some volume here, some volume of water. We might have some reaction happening. Um, let's say we have some contaminant that we're treating. Uh, C is the contaminant concentration. If I could spell, that would help. Okay, so we have some contaminant concentration C, so we have some amount of that in here. And let's say this is mixing. We have some flow rate coming in. Q will be our flow rate. And we're going to have some C not coming in. And then after the treatment, we have Q and C. Because whatever we have in here, the C is what's coming out. And we're going to, we're assuming it's perfectly mixed and everything is kind of ideal here. So how do we understand how much concentration we have removed? And if we can understand how much we're removing over time, then we can understand and design a system so that we use this process to achieve some desired goal. So that's, that's the end point. This process that we're doing right now is going to apply to everything else in the semester. It will make more sense as we go and we solve problems and take a closer look. But essentially what we're doing when we're defining a mass balance is we're defining based on the conservation of mass, where does mass go and how, what, what mathematical equation will tell us where it's going so that we can solve for any of these parameters. Maybe we don't know how much we start with but we know how much we're removing. So given that, we could figure out, um, based on the conservation of mass, how much we're removing over time, um, or excuse me, how much we started with if we know the other parameters. Okay, so what we do usually is we assume that we have a process that's continuous, it's happening, it's been happening, we're not changing the volume of the reactor, that would be kind of strange if you have a, a 10 cubic meter volume and you're running it, but you change the water levels up and down. That's not usually what we do. Instead, we keep a reactor running exactly the same volume um, with exactly the same flow rate, typically. Uh, sometimes we have to change that, but usually we design so that we have a constant system. If we have a constant system and a reaction that's constant, then eventually we're gonna get to the point where Maybe we're adding, let's say, C0 is 100 milligrams per liter, and our target, we're trying to get the contaminant down to 5 milligrams per liter, just as an example. Eventually, what we're going to find is that we can achieve um, a situation where the, the system's been running for a long time, flow's not changing, the input's not changing, eventually the amount of C in the reactor will reach a steady state. Now, C is being destroyed, let's say, in this, in this operation, in this reactor, but that means, but that doesn't mean it's, there's a, the amount is changing. Since we have the inputs and the outputs, it will eventually balance so that we're not accumulating, we're not increasing the total amount in there or decreasing it over time. Okay, so I'm going to hopefully give, um, make this a little more clear uh, as we go. So what we're going to say is we're going to define how much C is in here. Um, a good analogy here could be a bank account. Okay, if you imagine a bank account, and let's say you have a job and some expenses and a little bit of savings and a little bit of 
student loans, okay? On the input, we have income in this analogy. On the output, we have expenses. Money is coming in, money is going out. In the reaction component, we have a rate at which we're earning interest for savings, So that would be a positive. And we have a negative of interest for loans. So the amount of money in here can reach a point where over, you know, over a long period of time, it's not really changing. Um, obviously, you know, in the, in the short scheme of things, we have a bill that comes due and then we have income later a few days later or before or whatever so it's, it's going to be fluctuating but on average the amount there could stay the same um, if you were to balance um, the amount coming in with the amount going out uh, you could maybe just have no loans and no no savings and have exactly what you're coming in is going out that that happens sometimes you don't want obviously more expenses than income um, maybe you find a way to have no expenses at all and then you're accumulating money in the in the bank account so there's different ways to think about it um, and different ways that might be uh, useful to, to look at in terms of finances but this analogy carries forward to our reaction if we're looking at how much bacteria is in the system and maybe we're using the bacteria to destroy the waste products in the wastewater, then maybe we want lots of bacteria to accumulate in there. Um, and at some point we've reached a point where they can no longer grow any further, they're dying off at some rate, but they're also growing at some rate and we have a steady state. So when we talk about steady state, we're going to think about how this works if we reach that point where the, the amount of money in the bank stays pretty much constant. Um, despite the different inputs and the outputs and potential reactions. You know, if you had just income, just student loan payments as a reaction, taking away some, some percentage every month and some expenses, maybe you're, you're breaking even, you have the same amount in the account over time. Um, but we can think about the, um, that difference there, that we can have that reaction component in addition to the income and the expenses. Okay, so given that, we're gonna define steady state as the time when those that accumulation is zero. And so when we write a mass balance, we're always gonna use this form. We're gonna have accumulation rate is equal to the input rate. So over here is the input minus the output plus whatever reactions are happening. So we would have growth in the case here, the interest given from the bank as an example, and we'd have the decay. So any interest on debts. Okay, so th those are the um, really the only components that we have to think about. Now, sometimes we'll have different inputs, right? We might have two, three, or four, however many inputs to the system that we need. It doesn't matter how many we use, it's just that we can have more than one. Um, and those would all go into this particular step. If we have um, multiple outputs, the same thing. Multiple reactions, that's fine. We can just put them in each of these places. Okay, so I'm going to work an example with you. Um, so I would encourage you to grab a sheet of paper, a pen, um, maybe if you have a tablet or something, pull up a notepad, um, or even grab Excel and uh, work through this there. This is a very simple case of a mass balance. Um, so I'm gonna give you a couple moments to take a look and try your hand at it. So 
This is from our book, page 8, example 1.4. It says, a stream flowing at 10 cubic meters per second has a tributary feeding into it with a flow of 5 cubic meters per second. The stream's concentration of chloride upstream, chloride, by the way, is just Cl minus, is very inert. Um, that's part of table salt. When you dissolve sodium chloride, you get chloride and sodium. Um, this is different than chlorine, which is reactive and can destroy stuff. Just so you know, chlorine comes in a few forms, uh, ClO minus or HOCl. This is kind of your, your bleach compounds. You can also apply it as Cl2, which is a gas, and it will create these guys. So chloride is not bleach. It's not chlorine. Um, it's a, a different form. It's pretty unreactive, but it can be considered a pollutant for freshwater systems. Okay, so we've got chloride uh, coming in from upstream, and we say that upstream of this junction, we've defining this junction with this control volume, is 20 milligrams per liter. So we have it written right here in the stream, we've got 20 milligrams per liter and a tributary chloride concentration of 40. So over here is the tributary also entering the stream and making it a larger body of water. Okay, so we're treating the chloride as a conservative substance. When it says a conservative substance, that means we're not reacting with anything. So there's no reaction. That makes it nice and simple. We don't have to worry about the reaction term growing um, growth or decay of the substance. And we're gonna assume complete mixing. So another important assumption, as these two merge, we get perfect mixing and everything inside this control volume is perfectly well mixed. Then the question asks us to find the downstream chloride concentration. So what we're looking for is CM. We also notice that the, the diagram the book gives us, there's a question mark for the combined flow rate. Okay, so I want you to take a moment and consider what does the mass balance look like? And remember, this is going to be in the form of accumulation is equal to put, the, this is really the accumulation rate, right? It's going to be equal to the input rate minus the output plus whatever reactions we have and this would be growth minus decay and as we already said there's no reaction here okay so take a moment um, try working that out on your own ask any questions uh, you have in the chat and I'll solve it with you in just a moment. It's interesting. I guess I could tell you to pause the stream to solve it on your own if you'd like. Um, and then anybody watching the replay could do the same. I hadn't thought about that before. Okay. 
I'll go ahead and set it up. We have another slide here, with some more space. So keep working on it if you'd like. I'm gonna write, write and set it up a little bit. So here we go. Hopefully if you were writing up your mass balance here, um, you would have started, like I mentioned, with accumulation, equating that to some other terms. Here we have accumulation is equal to the input minus the output plus the reaction, and I went ahead and wrote the reaction as zero because we were told we have no, um, no reactions. So with our mass balance, what we want to do is take a look at everything entering and exiting the control volume. So this being our control volume boundary, anything, anything that is a, um, on the inputs and outputs, this is gonna be some physical process that adds or subtracts physically through this boundary. So if it's crossing that boundary, then we need to pay attention to it. When it's simply um, a reaction inside of it, that's going to be in this reaction component. Okay, so when we draw this control boundary, we see two entrances and one exit. And perhaps you could have done this intuitively, just two streams mixing, how much, what's the final concentration, but here's how to do it explicitly by designing it as a mass balance system. When we write a mass balance equation, we're going to write it in such a way that we can solve for one of the components. Um, sometimes this will be the concentration, sometimes this will be some other parameter, maybe the volume or the amount of time water is spending inside that volume. Uh, but regardless, what we're going to do is solve the, this, change this mass balance equation. This is a general equation um, describing simply the, the conservation of mass. And from here, what we're going to do is derive from it some formula that gives us a, constant, a, a term that we are interested in. So in this case, we're interested in CM. So I've taken it, I said zero accumulation. So we're gonna assume it's steady state. We have the inputs from the stream, the inputs from this wastewater that's adding a little more chloride. And then we have the outputs that is the combined stream leaving it. What we're interested in is the CM. So eventually we can get it to the point where we have just CM is equal to, uh, you know, if we divided both sides by QM here, so it'd be QSCS plus QWCW, all that divided by um, QM. So this is our, our final equation for CM, solving for CM. Uh, and if we look, we have most of the parameters, but we don't have QM. So here we need to take a moment and consider a different mass balance, which is just simply what's the flow. Um, we also have conservation of the water. In addition to conservation of the chloride, um, we also know we're not subtracting or adding any flow here. And for our class, we can always assume that. In, real, in reality, maybe we need to worry about evaporation if we have a big system, or maybe infiltration into groundwater. So there, there might be ways we could change the volume or change the uh, amount of water uh, with some other exits or entrances of water, maybe rainwater. But for our class, we're always gonna keep it so that flow, um, there's nothing more complicated 
aside from just what we see on the paper. So what we can say is the Q, the flow rate of the mixture, is going to be equal to the um, it's going to be the combination of the stream plus that waste wastewater entering. So here, this is simply going to be 10 cubic meters per second plus 5 cubic meters per second, which is 15. Okay, so that's one component that we need to add here. If you had gotten this far, then um, you would have noticed you're missing that piece and you would have to take a look at the problem again and find how, how to get that piece. Okay, so that leaves our CM. Here we just need to add, add the components. We have 20 milligrams per liter times the flow here is 10 cubic meters per second uh, plus that's this component and then we're going to add this one plus the 40 milligrams per liter times 5 cubic meters per second. All that divided by the 15 cubic meters per second. And this, again, it could be intuitive that just simply you're adding the total amount of stuff entering is going to be the total amount leaving. And so you probably, if you've done any sort of chemistry, uh, you've probably done calculations where you're mixing concentrations and finding the final concentration. This is the same thing except it's uh, a flow rate instead of a volume. Um, so it really makes very little difference here and then all we need to do is solve this problem. So this is on the top we've got 20 times 10 that's 200 uh, plus 40 times 5 that should also be 200. So it's essentially 400 divided by 15 and of course these units are going to be meters per second here and we take milligrams per liter times cubic meters per second that's going to be milligrams per liter times oops, times cubic meters per second we'll see that the cubic meters per second will cancel and that'll just be left with 400 divided by 15 which is 26.7, if I've done that right, uh, milligrams per liter. And one thing I can check real quick in my mind as I'm considering, okay, I just did this on the fly, I don't have it written down in front of me, um, I'm in front of a big audience, oh no, what am I doing? Kind of like being in an exam, right? Um, one thing I can check is, okay, 26.7, is that greater than the small one because we started with 20 in the mainstream and we added to that something that's a higher concentration and so we'd expect that at minimum it's 20 and in fact it should be more than 20. Um, likewise we can check at most it could be 40 because that's the higher of the two and in fact it should be less than 40 because we're diluting it and in fact it is between 20 and 40 so I'm, I'm confident that if I did make a mistake, it was very small and it's probably correct. And you guys can double check. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, did, did that work in your minds? Let me know. Okay, I can certainly come back to this and I will uh, will post that, update the, um, I think, good. And we will move on to the next set of slides. Um, like I said, I'll keep that open, so if there's any questions, happy to come back to it. Okay, so that's, again, that premise is going to be what we use throughout this class. That'll be both drinking and wastewater treatment. That'll be um, highly relevant. Membrane, membrane processes won't use quite the same system because instead of a reaction, we have some separation, but still the same principles of the system without the without the um, reaction term are going to be at play. So 
Well, we've just went over that the mass balance system. Um, we can expect to apply that in some way in every problem we do. Okay, so I want to talk about the other component, um, and that is what are we putting these react these um, systems in? What is the uh, what are the reactions that are happening inside, and what's um, ultimately are we are we looking at a, kind of a big picture? So right here we have a very large reactor. This would be a waste activated sludge reactor where we're aerating wastewater with lots of bacteria in it so that the bacteria can grow and consume all the complex waste products that are entering it. So we're using that as a tool and then we can separate the bacteria easier, easier later. So when we consider a system like that, we need to understand how it's functioning. So we just saw that we have the, the inputs and outputs and the reactions. Um, but in terms of a mass balance, some of some reactors we use are going to look a little bit different and then therefore our mass balance is going to be structured a little bit differently. As you saw just a moment ago, if you have two inputs, we expect that we have to use um, two different flow rates coming in. If we just have one input, then our mass balance equation changes a little bit. So we're going to talk first about these reactors, at least I think it's first in my slides, um, but we're going to talk about them separate. So the reactor, that's the physical shape of the thing that we're looking at, that's going to be different than the type of reaction that's happening inside. So it doesn't matter if your bank account is a checking account or a savings account or maybe you're investing in um, stocks and bonds in like an index fund or maybe you just have one stock and you're kind of gambling that way whatever the the reaction the the reaction inside might be the same in every case you're looking for interest gained but the reactor itself what does that look like may change okay so in terms of our uh our systems we're going to design the mass balance based on the reactor. So the mass balance structure will be based on the reactor. And then the reaction tells us, it, it kind of comes inside and tells us what, how does that equation look in terms of the growth component. So I'll, I'll make this more clear as we step through it. Um, as a first example, what we're looking at again here is this big tank all this air bubbles coming in that's mixing it up and causing this um, whole tank to be pretty well mixed it's almost as if we put an impeller in there and we're stirring around um, we've got that much air bubbles and action happening even just looking at this still photograph you can kind of see it it's, there's a lot of motion there if we have a system where it's well mixed we have some inflow and some outflow we typically call that a continuously stirred tank reactor. Okay, um, I'm going to come back to the reactor. Okay, I forgot and I'm doing reactions first. So we're going to look at this physical structure of what the reactors themselves look like, but first I'm going to deal with the actual reaction inside. Okay, so Again, let me repeat this so that hopefully there's no confusion at all. The reactions are separate and independent from the reactor structure. If I could spell. I still probably spelled that. Um, okay, independent from because the the reactor structure itself is just physical, right? That's just a physical shape, and the reaction could be a chemical or biological or some other um, reaction. Okay, I think it's an E. Okay, we're just gonna assume that's correct. 
Okay, so we can describe um, three reaction orders that are typical in chemistry and in other systems. When I say reaction order, what I'm referring to is how, many, how the reaction depends on how much stuff we have. Again, let's think for a moment about a bank account. If you're adding $20 to the account every day, you have a constant increase, incrementing the increase. If you earn 2% interest on it every year, you have a constant increase based on how much there is in it. The more you accumulate, the faster it's growing. So you see that difference there if you're just adding the constant amount compared to you're adding some percentage or some, some amount that depends on how much is already there. So hopefully that, that's a good uh, comparison for you for the zero order compared to the first order. The second order is compounded once more. It depends twice on the amount that's there. And so instead of an interest rate where you're earning 2% interest, instead it would be like, okay, you're gonna take um, you're going to take the amount and um, let's see how, how would be the best way to describe this. It, it would probably look like taking the interest rate and squaring it um, or taking, um, taking the, uh, the principal interest and having yeah, I, th I think kind of squaring it would, would make sense. You'll see, you'll see in this um, when we derive the equation. Um, but essentially, we're mostly going to focus on zero and, and first order. Second order reactions don't happen very often. And when they do, they're so quick and they are um, not, not easy to manipulate and um, control in most cases. So we're not really going to do much math with the second order. Um, we're not really going to apply that to many processes in the class, but it is important in some systems, so I'll mention it here and there. So mostly for what I want you to know is to be very familiar with first and zero order reactions. Okay, so I was mentioning that example um, of the different orders. So if we, if we take this one first, or let's say zero, actually. So zero, first, and second, these reactions are going to look, you know, if we take a look at the concentration over time, let's say we are, we are growing. So a growth reaction would look like that, where it um, should be linear over time. Didn't mean to curve it if I did. Whereas a first order would be growing over time. And a second order would be kind of a parabolic growth. It would look, it would be a very, um, a very rapid increase. Again, this is, you know, that bank account analogy, right? We have a certain amount of money added every month versus a certain amount of interest every month starts increasing. Um, if we had a decay reaction, it would be kind of the same thing, but it would just simply look um, you know, go in the, the other direction. Oops, I did that wrong. Sorry. This would be, it would decay faster when we have more of it there. And likewise, oops. this would be similarly sharp. I didn't draw very that very well, so I'll, we'll do one more time. Okay, so hopefully you get this picture, and this actually ends up working the, pretty much the same way as if we were comparing um, velocity to acceleration to um, jerk in physics, right? You have velocities, constant amount per time, or you know, distance per time. A, an acceleration is 
a growth in the velocity over time, and the, the jerk then is the growth of the acceleration. So you've seen this type of system before. Um, now we're just talking about the same math in terms of concentration of stuff in water. Okay, so then our rate equation is going to be this r, so the rate at which c changes, dc dt. We can define it generally as um, either growth or decay times a constant, so our rate constant, multiplied by the concentration that's there, so c is the stuff that we're growing or decaying, to the nth power. And n here is the reaction order. So if it's n to the 0, in the case of 0th uh, order, r of c equals um, plus or minus k times c to the 0, which goes to 1. So this is equal to plus or minus k. So that simplifies quite a bit. doesn't matter how much we have in the bank account. It's just going to be growing $20 every month or whatever. First order is going to be, you know, we're going to do the same thing. R of C is equal to plus or minus K times C to the 1 power. And C to the 1 power is just C. So that just stays as KC. Second order reactions, we have R of C equals plus or minus K times C squared. Okay. So in, in that case, we have, um, you know, the square, it's growing on a dependency of the square of C. One thing you'll notice here is the units for K are going to change depending on the reaction order. So the reaction order gives us information about how quickly it's going to change and how that depends on how much is in there. So if we, you know, I think on the next slide, what we're going to do is dig into the K to understand what units and how we can use the units um, to define uh, what's going on with our system. The reaction itself, at the kind of the high level, big picture here, the reaction itself is always going to be just like what we've done in the past. It's always going to be a mass per time. So this is always, at the end of the day, regardless of the equation, going to be simply mass per time. Because that's going to be our accumulation rate. So in our mass balance, what we're looking at here is just the reaction. The reactor deals mostly with these two, okay? Um, the reaction, the order, deals with what's happening here. And if you see, our accumulation is defined as mass per time. And if we're in some system, we need to know how much mass is being added, coming in, how much is going out. And then this reaction, it has to come back to mass per time. Um, and Usually what we're going to do is say V, the volume of the reactor, times the R of C. And so R of C times volume is going to be mass per time. So that means R of C is usually, and in our case probably always, mass per volume. So that's our concentration times time. Okay, so then when we take a look at what's happening here, in the zero order case, K has to have the same units as R of C. By, by definition, we have to have the units matching on both sides. Uh, and so we're, we're going to talk a little more about that um, with a little more space. But I wanted to point out um, this issue here where we need to match the units, and they're going to match the units of K have to change according to the reaction order. 
and we can learn what the reaction order is if we have the units of K. Okay, well, let's start with zero order reactions. Here we have our equation, R of C is equal to DC DT, which is equal to plus or minus K times C to the zero power. Again, C is our concentration, milligrams per liter. K then is our rate constant. And this has to be milligrams per liter per second, uh, if T is in time in seconds. So essentially what's happening is R of C is in milligrams per liter per second equals plus or minus K times one. So that means K needs to have the um, milligrams per liter per second as its units. And we see that right here. Okay, so now when we plot this, again, we can say this is going to be either growth or decay so if we plot the concentration per time, that's going to be a steady decrease for a decay. Um, it'll be basically constant. If we plot the difference, um, so the dc dt, so we take the derivative of the concentration, then since that was constant, this is going to also be, I mean, this was a constant decrease, this is going to remain constant. The, the rate of change, um, there, there is no change in the rate of change. Okay, and that, that should be, again, very reminiscent of how a velocity term works. When you take the derivative of a velocity, you have a just a constant. First order reactions, we see, do the same analysis here, and we see that the concentration, again, milligrams per liter, time in seconds, the rate of change you know, it may also help to write it out as, as dc dt. These units have to be milligrams per liter, if we're using milligrams per liter as a concentration, times seconds, if we're doing time in seconds. So this has to be satisfied. The, um, the units, we just define it that way. It must be that. That means that k times c together have to be milligrams per liter per second and we know that c is milligrams per liter so this is k times milligrams per liter oops I always want to write four today so k times milligrams per liter must be milligrams per liter per second so that means k is one over seconds for this first order reaction that's why we wrote it as seconds to the minus one. It's the same thing. Okay, so that's how we can know if we've got a first order reaction, our rate will be in per time. Now let me link back again to our analogy of um, an interest in a bank account. If we have um, some bank account and let's say you're earning 3% interest, let's say, on a nice savings account. We usually write it as 3%, but really what we're saying is 3% per year. And that means that your K equals, um, that, that's your rate constant, that's going to be, um, you know, one way you could look at that is 1.03 um, year to the minus one. So you multiply your, um, your amount of money by 1.03, so you, you're earning 3% of it um, every year. Now, Maybe, maybe we can make it look a little differently um, when we actually put it into the equation, but essentially what you're doing is you're earning that percent every year. 
That's why it's on a per year basis. That's why, um, that's why we have that, that unit per year. And in, in reality, we don't usually say that um, when we talk about bank accounts, but that's implied and assumed. So that means um, if we have concentration and it's decreasing over time, it ends up looking like this, or again, it could look like this. And the corresponding graph of the derivative, in this case, the amount that, of stuff that's being removed is constantly changing. It's changing at a constant rate until there's no more change, until we reach kind of the zero value. Okay, so far, does this make sense how we're defining these reactions? You guys tracking with me? Awesome. Great, thank you. Um, and again, this doesn't matter what what um, vessel we're doing this in. It, it could be my aquarium over there. It could be um, you know what happens in your blender, or your dishwasher, or washing machine. You can model these rates. You can put rates, reaction rates of something happening in all sorts of containers. It could be um, you know in the pipes and the vessel itself will change a little bit in terms of, it will change how we de develop the mass balance, but it's not going, to not going to change this reaction component. Okay, second order, we can do the same exact analysis, and we see that you know, DC, DT, this is going to be milligrams per liter per second, has to be equal to K times C squared. So now this is, K has to satisfy milligram squared over liters squared and get this back into the milligrams per liter per second. So this means that K is actually the inverse. So K is going to be liters per milligram and we need to add the seconds in there again. So this way, when we multiply, um, it'll take care of one of these, it'll take care of one of these, so then we're left with just milligrams per liter and per second. So that's that's how that works with the second order. So same exact process, just doing this unit analysis. Um, and again, this is going to be a very rapid decrease, and this guy will be that kind of first order decrease when we take the um, take the derivative. Wrong, you think it's the wrong s slide for K. Um, I think I've got the K's correct here. Um, can you explain a little better? I'm not sure what, you're, uh, what you mean. So in a second order reaction, it's KC squared. And again, we're not really gonna deal with the second order reactions. It becomes a little bit too complicated. Um, so we're not gonna worry too much about that, but it would be like, you know, the acceleration of acceleration. It says, oh yeah, thank you. So this seconds here, um, you're exactly right. That should be in the denominator there. So. In fact, I'm just gonna fix that real quick. Give me half a second and I'll fix it for you. You're, you're exactly right. It was supposed to be how I wrote it down here, and I had it wrong in the uh, slide there. So that's that's better. Okay, thank you. All right. So unless there's any questions about the reactions, um, we're, we're going to come back and derive 
um, mass balances that incorporate the reactions, but I wanted to get that part out of the way so we understand the difference if I say we have a zero order reaction versus a first order reaction. And hopefully now you can see that it's, um, it's going to be fairly important if we, if we take a look at um, how much stuff is in the system, if that's changing the rate at which uh, mass is accumulating, that's going to make a big difference. You know, if it's a swimming pool and we have water evaporating slowly, um, it doesn't matter how much water is in there, it's just a matter of the surface area. That's going to be a lot different um, compared to if we were um, having some other reaction, you know, it, some reaction that's growing bacteria, for example, based on how many were there to begin with, and every time they, they double, you know, doubling time of bacteria, you reach a very high bacteria count um, before long. Okay, so then, um, the reactor vessel itself, there's three different types that I want to cover. Um, and I'm going to, I think I'll have time to introduce each of these, and then next time we'll start deriving equations for mass balances that have these different reactors and they have some reaction happening inside them. Okay, so here I want to highlight first the batch reactor. This is the, probably the simplest case, and we're going to find out that it's actually going to be pretty close to the plug flow reactor um, in terms of the math that we use. So the batch reactor is going to be like my aquarium, like a glass of, of water, some container that has just a little bit of, uh, you know, has some fluid in it, has, has our water in it. It's well mixed, is how we design it, how we assume that what's happening. And that's, that's it. We just let it mix and there's, maybe there's some reaction happening. And you can see if there's no inputs and outputs, this accumulation is just going to be equal to whatever reaction is happening. So it's a very simple way to understand the reaction. In fact, in my lab, we um, do a fair bit of research on disinfection and water treatment technologies. And most of the time, we're really dealing with just a batch reactor because we don't have to worry about how much is going in or out. We just have a constant, um, a constant system in that manner. And the only thing we need to care about then is the reaction itself. Uh, that just makes it very convenient, easier to find the kinetics. A lot of times we're looking for K, trying to figure out um, the, the value of K um, in our system. Okay, again, let me stress, there's no dependence between the reactor and the reaction. So we have any type of reaction and any type of reactor. Okay, so the batch reactor, simple. It is a batch, and you have to operate in batches, which is why we call it a batch reactor. You have to fill it up, and then do your reaction, and then pour it out, and then fill it up again to do the next reaction. So if you are trying to treat lots of water, maybe this is not the best way to do it, right? You have to fill it up every time. That takes time. That takes energy to pump, uh, all of that. And there's a lot of wasted time, whereas if you had a CSTR, this continuously stirred tank reactor, <clears throat> go ahead and write this out. Sometimes people will call this different names. This is what our book re uses, so I'm, I'm sticking with that. Basically, this means we have a, a continuous flow. That's the other, other term that people use often as a continuous flow reactor. Um, we have this inflow, continuously providing water in, and then an outflow, continuously having water leave. The tank is still well mixed, so it's as if we just took a batch reactor and stuck a, a tube to either side, and we were pumping water through that way. Okay, so it's pretty much the same as a batch reactor, except we have the flow going in and flow going out. 
very simple. We're going to use this quite a lot. Um, but sometimes it's actually better for us to use what we call a plug flow reactor. So if you imagine a, a pipe or a garden hose, this is much more like a plug flow reactor um, than your continuously stirred re tank reactor. So usually these are long and narrow like a pipe. Sometimes we will set up a system where we have, you know, kind of a, a pipe like chamber where water is flowing through these channels. Uh, let's see. And ultimately out the end. Um, we'll just do this. So if I drew this well, you could see water can come in here and go through this maze-like structure and then eventually out here, apparently. Um, so if we make a system like that, then the water is not, you know, the water here is not mixing with the water over here. So we have a difference in mixing compared to the other, uh, to other types of systems. And what this does is let the reaction occur in a little bit of a different um, setting. So we call it a plug flow because we assume we have these plugs that are flowing through and each plug, it's kind of like having a conveyor belt with little cups that are flowing along. Each plug we assume to be um, essentially well mixed within itself, but not mixing with neighboring plugs. So then we have little batch reactors just flowing through on a conveyor belt. And what we end up doing when we model the math is treat it just like that. We can actually use the same exact math as a batch reactor, except we have to account for the time that the water spent in the reactor instead of the time we, you know, a stopwatch that we're using for the batch reaction before we dump it out. So this allows us to use the same type of kinetics, the same, um, the same essentially the same effect of reactions here um, in a continuously flowing system. Okay. So for a batch reactor, you know, we have just 10 minutes left. I think I'll probably stop here um, so that we can take a little more time and derive, derive these nicely with no rush. And then I, I think I probably have a, an example problem after that. Okay, so next week when we return, and again, as always, please feel free to chime in with any questions from what we've covered so far. I'll come back and we'll start with these reactors, go back through them briefly, and then start deriving mass balance equations with them. So on Tuesday, that's what we'll be doing, and we'll get into chemistry as well. I will aim to post your first homework um, next week sometime and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, any questions or issues, comments? So this, the blank um, PowerPoint should have been up, uploaded on Moodle, by the way. Uh, so next time, I'll try to do that every class so you can follow along on your own systems if you like. Um, and of course, as you may have seen by now, I, I did post last week's lecture, um, the, the file, the um, link to YouTube, and the file that we used for, um, for the notes. Okay, so otherwise I think this is a pretty good stopping point. Uh, I'll come back to it uh, next time. So if you don't have any questions, that's, that's all I'm going to have for you today, and hope you all have a good weekend. So feel free to Email me if you have any questions that come up later. Um, definitely let me know how you're, how you're going if you need something different in the class. Last time I was able to teach hybrid, so I at least had some students live in person um, uh, if there was some need to, to talk in person. So just let me know. 
um, otherwise, have a good weekend, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.